Congresswoman Omar, thanks so much for joining us on the show tonight. Glad to be here with you. Man. You were at the border. You were at the border on Friday, not in a gunboat like those Republican senators, but you met with kids in detention. What did they tell you about why they're coming here and how they're being treated? Thank you so much for asking that question. The, the kids that we met um, told us that they were coming here, um, one, to be reunited with their family members. Um, almost every single child I sat with and had a conversation with had a father, a mother, a sister, um, an aunt uh, that was living in the United States that they were reconnecting with. They also uh, told us about the, you know, uh, really horrific journey that they were um, that they undertook. You could see the trauma still in, in their eyes, even though they've been in the United States for a few weeks. Uh, and it also, you know, um, explained just the, the, the tragedies um, of, of the lives that they they fled. Uh, and, you know, it, for me, I sat next to uh, a, a young boy who was uh, 12 years old, um, who <clears throat> as soon as he started uh, talking, I, I leaned over and I said, you know, I was your age when I came uh, to, to the United States. Um, and, you know, he, he lit up, uh, I think, realizing that there were uh, lawmakers and others who also understood his journey. Um, and, you know, we asked him uh, what what message he wanted us to, to take to the president. And, you know, he said he came to the United States looking for an opportunity and just wanted to be treated uh, with dignity. And that's what these children deserve. These are kids um, who have escaped unspeakable um, conditions and yeah. they don't deserve to so be in detention centers. They deserve to be reunited with their families and they deserved for us to treat them with humanity and dignity. Indeed. And unfortunately, they're not being treated with very much humanity and dignity. Thousands of these kids are in detention, hundreds of them held for longer than the legal limit of 72 hours in CBP stations, many of them unable to use a shower for days or even see daylight. You were extremely critical of the Trump administration for putting kids in cages. Are you as critical of this Biden administration for also holding children in horrible conditions? Even if they say it's not their fault, it's what they inherited, the children are still suffering. Yeah, it's unacceptable and uh, really shocking um, that we are keeping children uh, in, in these situations. And it's not because we don't have uh, the resources uh, or the ability to move kids through um, our system and reconnect them with their families. Uh, you know, I, I didn't go into um, the border uh, center where children are, are held, where these horrendous uh, conditions exist. I went to a secondary location where uh, kids were living in um, a better condition, but still not an acceptable uh, condition that they shouldn't be there uh, for a long period of time. Uh, and what those folks told us that, that we're caring for these children uh, is that there there is an opportunity for the United States to deploy all agencies to the border to do uh, a one time processing of these children, kids who are coming in, who have a mother, a father. Um, to process them through, get them reconnected with their families, those who are coming, who have relatives, to, to process them as well, and those who are uh, in need of a sponsor and a, and, a, and a foster family, to put them in one of those nonprofit uh, centers that we have yeah. uh, and allow for the follow-up and, and the process that takes with caseworkers uh, to take place after. I mean, the conditions that we yeah. are keeping children in, no children are living in in other borders when people are uh, fleeing uh, their homes. And to have these really horrific, so, traumatizing conditions to exist in the United States for children is quite shameful. So you mentioned the 12 year old boy you spoke to at the border um, and your own experience that you mentioned to him. What was it like for you to live in a refugee camp in Kenya after you left Somalia and before you came here from, I think, the age of eight to 12 to be demonized and seen as a threat as so many refugees, including child refugees around the world, sadly still are? 
Right. Um, it is to 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 forever um, in, you know, in internally and externally feel uh, homeless when when you are a refugee, um, you become a political football uh, part of a, a, a conversation uh, and games those in power want to play with with your life. Uh, and, you know, it's it's really dehumanizing. And that's why I've try to focus this conversation about what's happening with these children and the solutions that we need to find uh, in, in, in their humanity and, and in their dignity. When I arrived at the age of eight at the border of Kenya, you know, I was processed and given an, an opportunity um, to, to be sheltered. Uh, and, you know, throughout those four years, I waited for a process to, to, to eventually have a better opportunity here in the United States. And, you know, the conditions I lived in were, were not acceptable as well, um, but they certainly did not resemble anything like the conditions that kids are living wow. at our border here in the United States of America. Well, that is depressing to hear. Just to shift to the big picture, it was reported by Politico that you were part of a congressional progressive caucus delegation that recently met with White House Chief of Staff Ron Klain. What asks did you make and what did you say, what do you say to your critics on the left who say progressives in Congress like yourself, the squad, the CPC, haven't pushed Biden hard enough on issues like the $15 minimum wage, universal health care, the filibuster? I mean, it is because that we have been pushing really uh, that the, you know, American Rescue Plan um, is deemed to be the most progressive uh, policy in decades. Um, we certainly understand that there was a failed uh, strategy, not by the progressives in, in Congress, because we put $15 in the package. Um, by by the administration, I think the their early signaling um, that that could be negotiated out and it might not stick um, as 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 part of the final package. Uh, really, I think endangered the ability for us to pass fifteen dollars. And so when we were in that meeting, we pushed for a strategy to get $15 minimum wage. We pushed for a strategy um, to, to, to pass the, the agenda that the administration ran on, that the Democrats agree on, whether it is you know, passing uh, sensible yeah. gun laws, dealing with our immigration um, uh, crisis, and, and, and all of the things that we all care about. What we walked away uh, from that conversation with is an understanding uh, that there is a limited uh, window of opportunity uh, for us to push these pieces of legislation. There are members in the Senate within the Democratic Party that are certainly not there yet uh, on the priority pieces of legislation that we have. Uh, and it's going to be up to the administration yeah. to come up with a strategy to push them because progressives in the House are constantly yeah. told to get in line uh, and to push policies that are going to have an impact on people's lives. That's what those Democrats in the Senate need to be told. And that's what's going to take. Uh, we're almost out of time. I want to ask very quickly, the Derek Chauvin trial starts tomorrow in your district, ex-police officer accused of murdering George Floyd. If he gets off scot-free, what will happen in Minneapolis? How will African-American communities across the nation react to yet another police killing without any consequences? I mean, as, as you could imagine, you know, our community is still traumatized by the murder of George Floyd, is traumatized by the events that unfolded with the uprising. Um, we are a community that has experienced time and time again injustice um, within the criminal justice system. Uh, and we're holding our breath. Uh, we know that um, he has... Uh, lots of resources and a great defense, uh, but we have faith in Attorney General uh, Keith Ellison and his team uh, and okay. their ability to do for justice. Let's see what happens. Congresswoman Ilhan Omar of Minnesota, thank you so much for your time tonight. Hey, thanks for watching our YouTube channel. You should know that you can follow today's top stories and breaking news and catch up on your favorite MSNBC shows all in one place. Download the NBC News app today.